the challenge for clinicians is to ask themselves how can they potentially identify those mechanisms that produce pain in their patients and then use that to select the most appropriate treatment for their patients. This slide just illustrates the basic organization of the sensory apparatus. We have primary sensory neurons which have cell bodies in the dorsal ganglion and these carry sensory information from the periphery to the spinal cord where there is active processing of this information and then transmission of this information to higher brain centers. This information is, in the spinal cord is actively regulated both at a local level as well as by descending inputs from the brain which can modulate both increasing or decreasing the transfer of information from the spinal cord to the brain. We have two clear sets of sensory fibers in the periphery, those with a high threshold, the nociceptors that are activated only by noxious stimuli and which produce nociceptive pain, and the low threshold fibers which normally produce only innocuous sensations. How do we, as clinicians, potentially identify mechanisms in our patients? The argument I'd like to present to you is that the best way we can do this at the moment is to use the pain phenotype, those combinations of signs and symptoms, that those constellation of features that our patients have as a guide to what the major underlying neurobiological processes are in our patients that are generating their pain. Because at present, the treatment of chronic pain is largely by trial and error. It involves making treatment choices without any identifying which patient is likely to respond better to a particular treatment or not. And in consequence, most of our patients are, do not benefit from our treatment. And we need to go through several cycles of treatment to try and find one that produces the greatest benefit. And I'm going to illustrate this by taking you through a, a series of scenarios illustrating how changes in the nervous system can produce particular uh, features, particular signs and symptoms. We'll start off in, in the case of neuropathic pain by looking at negative symptoms, the loss of some function. And in the case of damage to the peripheral nervous system, this could either be terminal atrophy, for example, in, in patients with diabetic neuropathy, as well as axonal degeneration, which may occur after trauma, invasion of a nerve by a tumor, or compression. In both of these cases, there's disruption of the continuity of the nerve fiber with its target, and consequent, there's a loss of sensitivity. So in the case of terminal atrophy in patients with peripheral uh, neuropathy, there may be an increase in the threshold to evoke a heat pain response. With axonal degeneration, the loss of sensitivity is generally more dramatic and will depend on which sets of fibers are lost, but there may be a general loss of sensation. When we deal with pain though, obviously we are more interested in positive symptoms. The actual pain itself is a positive symptom. And so what I'd like to describe now are some of the positive symptoms that are characteristic of clinical pain states. And we'll start off by a particular positive symptom that results from the reduction in sensitivity of nociceptors. I indicated before that a nociceptor is normally specialized to respond only to intense stimuli, such as intense temperatures. It is this capacity which enables us to differentiate a stimulus that is pleasantly warm from one that is uncomfortably hot and that actually produces heat pain. Now, one of the features of clinical pain syndromes, both inflammatory pain and neuropathic pain, is that the sensitivity of these nociceptors may alter. And this is the consequence of changes in the transducer proteins that convert thermal stimuli into electrical activity. And one example of this is a channel called TRIPV1. And TRIPV1 is the channel that's activated by capsaicin, which is the pungent ingredient in chili peppers. And the reason that we find chilies hot when we eat a hot curry, for example, is that they act on the same sensory uh, channels that, pr that actually produce heat pain. Now, one of the features, as I've mentioned, of inflammatory and neuropathic pain is heightened pain sensitivity, what we call a peripheral sensitization. And this is a result of a decrease in the threshold for activating nociceptors as a result of a heightened sensitivity of these trip channels. Now, once we know the mechanism, which is peripheral sensitization produced as a result of a change in the function of trip channels, such as TRIP-V1, and we understand how this can present in our patients, for example, as 
a heat allodynia where a normally warm stimulus is now experienced as being painful, we then have an insight into the mechanism in this patient that is producing their pain. And this can guide us as to the best treatment for our patient. For example, in this particular circumstance, a trip channel antagonist, a trip V1 antagonist, may be the way to reduce this heightened heat pain sensitivity. And this really is the thesis that I'm going to argue for the rest of the talk. By understanding the mechanisms and how they generate the pain phenotype, we can make the best selection about what is the most appropriate treatment to use in our patients.